So I guess we probably should get into Skeddy XT then. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of a lot of terms we need to go over as we do this. But no problem. <laughs> at a high level, what is Skeddy XT and what problem is it trying to solve? Okay, so um, Skeddy XT is a new pluggable scheduling framework. Um, and the idea is it lets you implement your own scheduling policies, your own host-wide scheduling policies, um, and implement them as, what's, as what are called BPF programs. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, when I say host-wide, what I mean is um, these are threads. If you are running in CFS or EVDF, you instead bring them over to your scheduler. If you have like what are called real-time threads or deadline threads, these threads that are running these higher priority schedule, scheduling classes, those don't, those don't run in your scheduler. They stay in the kernel. But you migrate all of the, the other default threads to yours. Now, so that's the host-wide part. Um, the BPF part, so BPF stands for a Berkeley Packet Filter. And that originally, if you ever heard the term, you may have heard it in terms of packet filtering, as you might imagine, which was added to the kernel quite a while ago. But since then, um, something called what, what many people call eBPF, extended BPF, has been added, which is completely different. Mm -hmm. And that lets you run a, a JIT inside the kernel, which is insane when you think about it. But you can, there's actually an instruction set for BPF. There's, there's BPF specific encodings for instructions. Um, there's a backend for the LLVM compiler where if you have C code, it'll compile the C code into BPF instructions. And then it, and, uh, at runtime, you know, throughout the runtime of the kernel, the kernel will read that BPF bytecode and um, emit x86 instructions or whatever architecture you're running on to run the actual program natively in the kernel. Um, and there's a couple of things that are special about that. So first of all, um, kernel modules also do something similar for anybody who's heard of those before. But there's they're very different than BPF programs for a number of reasons. For example, BPF programs can't crash the kernel. Uh, the kernel will statically analyze the BPF program in a component called the verifier. And if the program could be unsafe, like you're reading a pointer that you shouldn't read, or um, or you're uh, you're not dropping a reference, like you, you have a memory leak or something like that, it won't let you load the program. Um, and um, it also has all sorts of ways of interacting with user space from your BPF program. Like there are these data structures called maps, where you can have in real time shared memory that you that you can write and read from both user space and kernel space. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of there's a lot more to say, way more to say about BPF. But the basic idea is it's a safe environment for running uh, dynamic dynamically loading and running programs in the kernel. And SCEDX is a framework that uses BPF to implement host-wide scheduling policies that are also safe and can't crash or can't hang the, the machine either. Mm -hmm. Now, as yeah, as far as why what, what problem is it trying to solve? Well, um, so EVDF, CFS, these are these are general purpose schedulers. Um, they do really well for, for what they do, right? They're general purpose. They, they're fair. They have a lot of, they've been worked on for many, many years and they're very well optimized. Um, but there's a few drawbacks. Uh, for one thing, um, I don't know, uh, for any of, any of the viewers who have ever done kernel work before, you know how much fun it is to compile a kernel, reinstall it, reboot it, and then you have a bug where you crash something or you corrupt your, your disk or your file system and you're like, great, I have to do all this again. So the, the safety aspect is really nice. You know, for a BPF program, you recompile it. It takes like two seconds to compile, and then you just rerun it, and you the kernel loads it, starts running it for you. It loads it in, does everything under the hood to, to transition the whole system to using it, and it just runs. So, you know, for Meta, if we're, if we're like running an experiment on, on thousands of hosts, it's, it's just not even an option for us to do like this iteration where we're, we're loading a kernel onto thousands of hosts, waiting for the caches to warm back up, then doing measurements and oh, a crash or like what's different about this and whatever. So, so it makes it, it about as simple the, as like, you know, testing a regular user space application. Oh, you just compile it, run it, it just goes. It's literally that easy. Yes. Um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I guess a little bit different because it has host wide implications, but it's in terms of the, the, the iteration time. Yeah. It's exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, the other big problem it solves uh, is that you do leave a lot of performance on the table for, for a general purpose scheduler in certain scenarios. Um, and so, you know, for us, we have Meta as, a, as an easy example. We have a lot of large services that are kind of monoliths, like web, um, stuff like that. And so we, there's just too much scale for us to kind of leave the, the scheduling on the table, the scheduling benefits we can get on the table. And um, you know this allows us to build scheduling policies that that just aren't appropriate even to be merged into a general purpose scheduler. So 
things that like would never be able to get upstream, we can build them in SCEDEX as well mm-hmm. and, um, and use them internally. Um, and then, yeah, the crazy ideas like the, like the, uh, the vCPU, like a uh, cloud, cloud computing thing that I was talking about earlier, that stuff as well, like, it enables you to do that. So you could like make your own scheduler even without something like this. It would just be a lot more of a slow iteration process that would just, just not be suitable, in, especially in cases like this. Uh, you could. I, I wouldn't recommend it because it's um, the API for building these schedulers in the kernel is very complicated and it requires you to understand kind of the core logic of the scheduler. Like, think like callbacks will be called in different contexts and you have to understand what context you're being called in for something to make sense. Um, so you can do it. Like, Google's written some schedulers, like lots of companies have. But if this is something that you're interested in, I, I would. I mean, I'm biased, but I really wouldn't recommend doing that. I would recommend looking at SCEDEX. It's going to be a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Um, the callbacks are, are like, we, we also tried to make the callbacks and the API like much more kind of intuitive and, and reflecting the policy instead of kind of the system around it. Right. So is there some sort of performance overhead of this approach? Obviously, there's going to be some, but like, is it a... Obviously, if you wrote your own, you would be, you know, directly interacting with it. You wouldn't have this extra thing here. Maybe I'm explaining this badly, um, but, like, what sort of overhead does come with SCADXT? There's a much better way to say it. Oh, that, that's it's a really, really good question. And um, there is an overhead. So when you when you go with something like with a, with a BPF scheduler, you have to take the overhead of, of, um, of going through the BPF interface, which is, means doing, like, indirect calls and stuff like that. Um, so there's certainly an overhead to, to doing it in SCEDEX. Um, it's really minor from what we've seen. It's like a couple tenths of a percentage overhead relative to just using a native scheduler. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes it's, it's pretty hard to, to get over that, that hump, depending on what you're, what you're doing. Um, uh, and certain things, you know, something like EVDF is like super well suited for it. So there's just no point in even trying uh, unless you wanted to build it in SCEDEX itself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a couple tenths of a percent. So you know, pretty like pretty low, and th- and the reason it's so low, something I should probably make clear is that BPF is not a user space framework. Like when you implement a scheduling policy in BPF, the kernel is actually calling directly into your program and staying in kernel space. You can build user space components on top of that, and we actually do have schedulers where we have like load balancing done in user space. But the hot paths, everything stays in the kernel. There's no up. There's no like handshake with user space or anything like that, and so um. The overhead is really is really minimal, um, and you know the, the trade off obviously works out quite well in a lot of scenarios. For anyone unclear about it, what does a load balancer do? Another great question. So um, I'll try to give a quick overview of this as well. So if you imagine load is in simple terms, load is just how much stuff is running on a system. So if you have like two threads that are always runnable. Um, then you know you might have load of 200 because the default weight for a thread is 100, and load is weight times basically how long the thread can run for. Now, if you imagine a really complex system, which obviously most of them are, even if your machine is sitting idle, there's K threads running and all this stuff. Um, the goal of a load balancer is to balance load across the system. Um, and the thing I said earlier about EVDF, where you have this V runtime per core, where you count how much time each thread is run. That's from the perspective of a single core. So each core has its own run, its own run queue, and has its own counter of v runtime. Um, and so within a specific core, everything is fair. But when you go between cores, and especially when you go between what are called scheduling domains, so like between cores that are grouped into L3 caches, at that point you have to use this sort of higher level view of load to try to balance the system. And that's kind of what, yeah, that's what the load balancer is doing. Right. So. I don't know where I was going to go with that, actually. <laughs> well, so I, I, I can go into a little more yeah, detail. Yeah, no, if you want to, I, I, there was some, I had something there. It just, it just <laughs> Dude, it's stuff, stuff is so complicated. Um, so yeah, like, okay, you imagine you have you have two cores, four threads. Right. And three of the threads are running, um, you know, a third of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, let's keep it simple. They all run 100% of the time, and they all have the same weight, and they're all in one core. And that means that one of the two cores has has load of 400 because you're just adding it up, and the other one has load of zero. Mm-hmm. And the goal is to distribute this load evenly, right? Yeah, every thread should be getting its proportion of compute capacity mm-hmm. relative to its proportion of load. And so what I mean by that is if the total load in the system is 400 amongst these four threads, each of them have 
load of 100, which again is wait times how long it can run, wait times duty cycle, then they each get 100 over 400 equals a quarter of the compute capacity in the mm -hmm. system. And so there's two cores. So each of those cores should get 200, should be responsible for 200 load each. And so the load balancer would say, oh, there's 400 on this core, zero on this core. They should each have 200. So I'm going to move two of the threads over. And now they each have 200. And the system is fair. The system is balanced. That's, mm -hmm. that's essentially what it's doing. So, OK, so the load balancer is there to make sure the work is distributed across the different threads. And then the scheduler is there to make sure the work that is there gets a suitable, uh, suitable amount of time for those individual tasks. Yeah, well, so, so the scheduler is both parts of it. The scheduler's job is to both distribute load amongst cores mm -hmm. and also to ensure fairness on a, a specific CPU or interactivity. Um, if you look at the actual scheduling code, the uh, the load balancer is like kind of in its own thing. Like you do it, you do it after some amount of time, or when a core is going to go idle, it might pull load onto the core. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's, it is both both of those things are, are certainly part of the scheduler. And um, you know, for example, like you, the scheduler has to scale to like thousands of cores for some huge machines. So you'll accumulate load within a specific within a single core, and then when you load balance, you'll sum the core. Sorry, you'll sum the load between them. You know, from one core, whichever one is load balancing. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's it's confusing because it's sort of they're both kind of related to fairness, but they're very different ways of looking at it, and there's very different problems with each of them. Mm -hmm. um, but it is both of both of them are the scheduler.